Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kambiz Ranavardi, a Columbia DC board member and a graduate of School of Engineering and Applied Science. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners uh, for this evening, uh, Columbia University Club of New York and their members. So welcome. Uh, we are very honored to have Jason Smerden, a Lamont Research Professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, co-director of the undergraduate program in sustainable development of the Earth Institute, and also co-senior director for education at Columbia University's new uh, climate school to talk to us about the current water woes of the American Southwest, uh, its, its history and its arid future. And this would be in conversation with Lili Jamali, who is a senior reporter for Marketplace. Uh, please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to um, to check our website for their uh, uh, full full bios. <coughs> Sorry, uh, Professor Smerden uh, teaches both uh, graduate and undergraduate courses on climate, environmental change, and sustainable development at Columbia. Um, he also lectures uh, widely in public and private settings uh, on topics uh, such as climate change and its social dimensions. Uh, Professor Smerden's uh, research uh, focuses on climate variability and change during the past several millennia and how uh, the past uh, uh, climates can help us understand what to expect in the future. Uh, he's the uh, contributing author of the assessment report five of the working group one of the intergovernmental panel on climate change. He's also a co-author of the textbook, uh, Climate Change, the Science of Global Warming and Our Energy Future, which was published by Columbia University Press. He received his BA in physics from Gustavus Adolphus College and his PhD in applied physics from the University of Michigan. And our um, host, uh, Lili Jamali, is, as I mentioned, senior reporter for uh, uh, Marketplace, covering business and economy, uh, which airs on uh, hundreds of NPR channels across the country. Uh, prior to Marketplace, uh, she was uh, a co-host of the California Report on, on the Bay Area's KQED. And before that, uh, she, she worked for Bloomberg TV Canada, Reuters TV in New York and San Francisco, and also as a freelance foreign correspondent in Central and South Asia, as well as Latin America. She holds a master's degree from Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, an MBA from Stern, and a bachelor's degree in English from UCLA. So without further ado, um, it's all yours, Lily. Thank you so much, Cambies, for that very kind introduction. The issue of climate variability and climate change is something that we read a whole lot about now. And for me as a reporter, it's something that I report on a whole lot more than I did just you know, five, 10 years ago. But looking at how it's played out over the last several millennia is such a critical angle on this important story, especially, especially as we plan where we go from here. And it's a lens that we don't look at nearly enough, one that we should, which is why I jumped at this opportunity to spend this time with Jason and all of you this evening. Afternoon, if you're like me out here on the West Coast, you can see behind me, it's still light out. Um, probably still light on the East Coast as well. There's gonna be a QA, and a so feel free to send questions as we go. Uh, but without further ado, I wanted to um, have open up the mic to Jason so he can give his presentation. We'll have a brief conversation and then we'll take as many of your questions as we can. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lily. Uh, give me a second here while I share my screen and get set up. All right. Do that. Get my laser pointer going. All right. Can you all hear me and see my slides? I can't see any of you, but I see Lily giving me a thumbs up. So I'm going to assume that the rest of you can see as well. Well, I want to thank uh, Kambiz and Lily for all the work that they put in uh, to prepare for this event. It's a real pleasure to be here. I also want to thank Jennifer Soboleski, Stacey Vassilo, uh, and Paul Lindbergh on the Columbia side for setting this up. Uh, like I said, it's a real pleasure to be doing this. Um, science doesn't happen in a vacuum, so I also want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, in particular Park Williams, who's lead author on a lot of the work that I'll be showing you, close collaborators Ed Cook and Ben Cook, uh, 
uh, Casey Bowles, who was a postdoc with us at Lamont, and Hun Beck, who was a graduate student of mine. I also want to thank all of you for funding uh, the research that I'm going to show you through your contributions to the National Science Foundation, to NOAA, and uh, D the Department of Energy. They make the work that we do possible. I also want to give a little shout out from uh, where I'm presenting today. So this is Hogan Hall. Maybe some of you were uh, residents in the dorms above our offices here. Uh, I'm sure you walked by this building at 114th and Broadway uh, many times, perhaps since the Earth Institute and subsequently the Columbia Climate School has uh, moved into its first two floors. I'm down here in this jail cell uh, presenting from my office but uh, I hope that you remember this space fondly and, and can think about uh, what I'm presenting is coming from this part of campus that you probably all remember and walked by many times. Okay, so we're gonna talk about drought today and I wanna orient you with a few things. Uh, first of all, I wanna show you a series of pictures of drought conditions as characterized by the US Drought Monitor. Uh, the map that I'm currently showing you is based on the latest data from July 26. And everywhere where you see maroon or dark red are regions of exceptional or extreme drought. And you can see that uh, drought is distributed across much of the US Southwest into the um, Southern Central Plains uh, and other locations. But what I'm gonna do now is flip through a few more slides showing what these patterns look like back in time. So here were drought conditions a year ago, almost exactly on June 29th. You can see once again, a real bullseye over the US Southwest. The drought over the um, Southern Plains was, was not there, but there were drought patterns over much of the Pacific Northwest and the Midwest. If we go back 10 years from present, uh, this is the drought pattern from that summer, same time. This was a drought we actually coined as a continental drought because you can see it's distributed across mo most of the lower 48. Once again, a focus over much of the Southwest in addition to the other locations. And finally, this is what the drought conditions looked like 20 years ago. Once again, a bullseye over the Southwest. So the point here is that drought conditions move around uh, from year to year. There are different regions affected. But just from these four slides, you can get a sense that particularly the, U the US Southwest is a region that um, has been under drought conditions, extreme drought conditions for a long time. In fact, this drought has been going on uh, for the last 23 years, including this summer, uh, starting in the year 2000, moving around in terms of its spatial extent, but really focused in, a, in an extreme and, and specific way over the West, and in particular, over the US Southwest. So I'm gonna zoom in on that area, and I just wanna get you oriented on some of the geography and some of the regions that I'm gonna be talking about. The Southwest is embodied in, uh, these seven states, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and California. And many of, much of those states sit within uh, the Colorado River Basin, which is a critical water resource for the arid U.S. Southwest. In fact, this basin supplies water to over 40 million people. It irrigates more than 5 million acres of farmland. And the cities in much of the Southwest are also very re reliant on the river for their water. Las Vegas gets 90% of its water uh, from the Colorado River Basin, Tucson, 82%, San Diego, 66, and so on. So the Colorado River Basin is a vital uh, resource, and I'll be talking about a couple of the locations along uh, this, the, the river, namely uh, Lake Powell behind Glen Canyon Dam, and in particular, we'll be going to uh, the Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this subject without going to Lake Mead. It seems to be the ground zero for how this uh, drought is reported on. And of course, there are many um, pictures that come from Lake Mead that have become iconic. Uh, this is Lake Mead this year. One of the things that you'll notice in this picture are the white bathtub rings representing how far the, the lake has receded and uh, reduced its elevation over this 23 year period. But of course, we're seeing even more uh, dramatic and extreme examples. This is a picture of the World War II Higgins landing craft that uh, was uncovered as the waters receded. This boat wasn't, uh, didn't sink during World War II. Uh, these boats were actually used for surveying the Colorado River um, multiple decades ago, and, and that's when this boat was, um, was sank in Lake Powell. Um, in, 
more macabre uh, stories. You've probably heard some of the stories in the news about bodies being found uh, as the waters recede, uh, some of which were um, the were bodies that uh, were people who were murdered um, multiple decades ago, and these crimes have been reopened as these bodies have been found um, on the lake bed. So in many ways, some of these stories, I think, feed into a very dystopian uh, fantasy novel. It wouldn't be um, inaccurate to say that's the case in, in many regards, but this is, this is Lake Mead on the ground. If we zoom back out and, and look at Lake Mead through satellite photos, this is where we can really get a sense of why these kinds of things are being discovered. This is Lake Mead on July 6, 2000, um, at almost the height of its um, capacity. I'm just going to move forward to a picture of Lake Mead from July 3rd uh, this year. If I toggle back and forth, you can see the extreme reduction in the size of Lake Mead, and you can imagine um, these shorelines being exposed in pictures like the one that I just showed you. Um, Hoover Dam is down here. Las Vegas is in this region here. In fact, if you go back and forth, you can see uh, some of the development associated with Las Vegas between these two pictures. But it's also important to note that Hoover Dam is in addition to um, the role that it plays in delivering water to over 40 million people in the Colorado River Basin, it's also an important hydropower resource uh, supplying power to over 1.3 million people in the region. So another sort of on the ground picture coming back to uh, the lake shore, this gives you a sense of what the reduction in capacity looked like directly at Hoover Dam. So this is in 1983, and this is last year in 2001. These are the important intake towers where water is uh, taken into the dam and then funneled through the dam to create hydropower, and I'll be talking about those in a little bit. But if we look then at the elevation of Lake Mead since it was filled in the 1930s, you can see that it's gone up and it's gone down. But in particular, over the last 23 years, uh, the elevation of Lake Mead has steadily decreased over the period of this drought. It is now at a record low, lower than any time since when it was filled in the 1930s. And there are some looming, um, looming thresholds as the waters recede that are important to, to, to think about. And so those are, are listed here in this chart, but I'm going to show them in more dramatic fashion in the next slide. So currently, the record low, 1,049 feet elevation in Lake Mead. The reason why that is important is that the infrastructure of Hoover Dam is actually intimately tied to lake level. You can imagine that if the lake level goes down too far, uh, it might cause problems for the way that the dam built, and that is in fact uh, what's happening. So this is the dam being built. You can see those intake towers that I just showed you, and it turns out that the base of those intake towers is at 890 feet elevation, so not much lower than this 1,049 feet, although water planners uh, seem to be confident that we're not gonna be down near that level um, for at least the next few years. But this is around the elevation that's been noted as Deadpool. It's not just a Ryan Reynolds franchise. It's also the point at which the water behind Lake Mead effectively becomes useless for doing the two things that the dam is most important for, that's generating hydropower. So these intake towers uh, stop taking in water at 890 feet. It turns out that they actually can't take water all the way down to that point because they start taking in air and can damage the turbines that the water um, ultimately travels through. On the other side is the intake um, tubes that are used to pump water and bring water from Lake Mead to municipalities like Las Vegas. And those intake tubes are actually um, at various levels within the reservoir, the lowest one is at 895 feet. In fact, this, this intake pipe number one is already exposed and is no longer taking in water to be pumped and used for human consumption within uh, places like Las Vegas. And so the real critical concern here is that as the level of the lake continues to recede and as elevation falls, we get to this point of Deadpool where um, the reservoir is no longer producing hydropower and can no longer be used to um, pump water for human consumption either. So some really critical thresholds that are um, 
coming into focus in a way that uh, certainly the water planners who built Lake Mead uh, never imagined was possible given the conditions under which it was built. So this isn't just happening at Lake Mead. As I mentioned, this is a widespread drought. Uh, the other critical reservoir on uh, the Colorado, Colorado is Lake Powell. Its story is similar in that um, it has reduced its elevation steadily over the course of this drought and is reaching critical levels um, where, in this case, Lake Powell will no longer degenerate hydropower, which it does for roughly 5.8 million people. Um, and if it goes down to 3,370 feet, it can no longer release water downriver and, uh, and replenish, for instance, Lake Mead. So that also is a very critical point. So these reservoirs, these two large reservoirs on the Colorado River have been drastically impacted by um, the drought, as well as the water allocations, the way that water is being used in the upper and lower Colorado River basins, which is another story that I think Lily and I will talk about a little bit. And we can certainly address in the Q&A after the talk. So it's not just the Colorado River ba uh, Basin that's being impacted. You can go to some of the other major lakes in the west and southwest and see the impacts of this drought. Uh, this is from a story in the New York Times about the Great Salt Lake um, and the conditions there. The Great Salt Lake since, since 1987 has been reduced by two thirds. This is a closed basin lake, so there's no drainage out of um, this Great Salt Lake. It's fed by three different rivers. This is of course partly a story about water management and how the water is being used, but it's also tied to climate change. The level of this lake is impacted by evaporation over the summer months. It's also critically dependent on snowpack, um, part of which is fed by evaporation off the lake. So as things, as a lake is reduced, there's less evaporation, which generates less snowpack, which generates less water that's being recycled for replenishment. Um, so an important climate change story there as well, but also some real dramatic, just like uh, with the Colorado River um, Reservoir, some real dramatic human implications about the water as it's used for the bird, po the tens of millions of bird populations uh, that use the lake um, as a stopover point. As the lake reduces in size, its salinity goes up, which means the brine shrimp can't live in the lake, which means there's no food for the birds when they stop over. And also in, I think, a very um, serious sense for Salt Lake City, which is down here um, in the southeastern part of this picture, this exposed lake bed is also contaminated with a lot of arsenic and a lot of other heavy metals uh, due to the mining activities in this part of the basin. And that's being looked at as a very serious threat. It was described by one Utah Republican state lawmaker as a potential environmental nuclear bomb that's going to go off if we don't take some pretty dramatic action. And what he was describing is the dust storms that will ultimately take up the sediments from the lake bottom, especially if it continues to reduce in size and create toxic dust storms that have the potential to blow over the large population centers of Salt Lake City and cause drastic effects as a consequence. Another impact of this drought as we see it unfold is wildfire. Wildfire has been increasing drastically throughout much of the West. This uh, is a wildfire from this year. It's the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire in New Mexico. This fire is still burning incidentally. It's um, mostly contained, about 98% contained according to the fire service, but um, it is still burning. This was, the largest wildfire by acres in uh, New Mexico history. It's now burned over 340,000 uh, acres of forest. And this is one of the many stories that uh, we are seeing with regard to fire, which is tied to drought conditions out west and the very dry tinderbox um, environment in which these fires can spread and increase in size. In fact, if you look at the acres burned, since 1960, you can see that those things jumped around, but uh, the amount of acreage burned, this only goes up through 2020, 2021 was a huge year, um, but you can see the area burned by fires in the West increasing dramatically um, as things begin to dry um, at the turn of the millennium. And then one of the things that we've studied and another thing that is critical for agriculture in the Southwest, despite much of it being um, irrigated, uh, 
is soil moisture conditions. But in this case, soil moisture is a measure of what's coming into the system, namely precipitation and what's leaving the system through evaporation from the land surface and transpiration through plants. And so you can look at this as a, as a water balance measure. You can see that since 1900, water in, in this is an area average over the American Southwest. You can see that water has gone up, it's gone down, but starting in 2000, uh, we've seen mostly negative uh, soil moisture anomalies and this period as a whole has been quite dry relative to the rest of the record. So I actually started at Columbia in 2005, which was this year here. And I wasn't thinking about drought at the time, but it's interesting to think about the fact that uh, since I've been at Columbia, this, this event has been unfolding and evolving. And it was really about 2010 that I got involved in a lot of the work that was being done at Columbia and Lamont on drought. I want to give you a little bit of context for that. But the idea is that many of us started thinking as, as we've watched this event unfold about how it might compare to previous events, what's causing the drought, um, both on a year-to-year -year basis and over this much longer time period of 23 years. And that's what's motivated a lot of the research that I'm, I'm going to show you. But I want to give you a little bit of context for how we got there. And so maybe you've been paying attention to this story in the news. Uh, mega drought as a term has been thrown around a lot, but it fairly describes this 23 year period um, over the Southwest. And I wanna give you a little bit of context about what that means. Um, there's, no, there's no specific definition of mega drought, but generally speaking, the main characteristic that we assign to mega droughts is their duration. And, uh, that duration is, is on the order of several decades. In some cases and in some locations, it can be on the order of a century or longer. But in general, the idea that has been ascribed to a mega drought, what defines something as a mega drought, is this long-term du duration, the persistent dryness that we've seen over the last 23 years, and that we know to have happened over other periods in the history of the Southwest. So there's been a lot of research done contextualizing um, drought variability in the West. And there's been a, you know, a multi-decade understanding of the idea that mega droughts uh, occurred in the Southwest, particularly over the medieval period. So this is a famous study that was done in 1994, one of the early mega drought studies. Um, it was done by Scott Stein. And what you're seeing in this picture are what are called relic Jeffrey pine stumps. So these trees can't grow in water if their roots are exposed to water. And so that's one of the reasons they're dead here is because they can't grow in this riverbed, but they clearly grew at some point when things were much drier and they weren't submerged in water. And it turns out that you can date these tree stumps and you can count the rings within these tree stumps to give an estimate of when they lived and how long they lived. And the study that Scott performed was to show that these trees all lived sort of in two different periods during the medieval era about a thousand years ago, and they each lived for about a hundred years. And so for them to have lived in this location um, for that amount of time, the drought conditions or more arid conditions would have had to exist in this region of uh, the California Sierra Nevada for at least a century. And so these are witnesses of a much more arid period in this part of the Sierra Nevada indicating that this region experienced very prolonged droughts on the order of a century um, over two different periods during the medieval era. So we have natural archives like tree rings and, and, and other um, sediment records, et cetera, but we also have archeological records. So these are the famous cliff dwellings. This is Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde. We can date based on the trees in, in, these, um, in these beams in the cliff, dwe cliff dwellings, when the construction started, when it finished, and roughly when these um, dwellings were abandoned. This particular um, settlement was constructed in the late 1100s and then abandoned in the late 1200s, um, a period of time that we know severe drought to have existed over much of the Southwestern region. Um, there are other settlements like Chaco Canyon that similarly um, were built and then abandoned over these drought periods that we know to have existed. This is the Nebraska Sand Hills. Perhaps some of you have been there. Um, this is what it looks like if you're on the ground. This is an aerial footed, uh, footage. 
you'll see that there's sort of a wave pattern to these. That's because these were active dune fields during the medieval uh, period, uh, ind indicative of a much drier, more arid climate. These were mobile dunes that were moving and taking dune uh, formations. And then eventually they became frozen in time as the climate got wetter. Uh, vegetation was able to grow and stabilize these uh, dune formations throughout Nebraska. But again, this is another, in this case, geomorphological piece of evidence suggesting a much more arid period of time, particularly during the medieval interval about a thousand years ago. And then we have my favorite, which is the evidence that tree rings provide. I already talked about one form of tree ring evidence, but um, more widely, there are trees available all over the Western United States. Most of these trees, because they grow in arid environments, are limited by the moisture they receive. So when they're happy, when they get lots of moisture, they put on thicker rings. When they're not so happy, when things are in drought, they put on much thinner rings. So you can see um, how these rings evolve. The late 1500 mega drought is during this period. This was a drought that lasted 23 years. And you see these very thin, thin rings that were put on in this tree um, before it came out of the drought into the 1600s and the, and the ring widths got um, larger again. The nice thing about this record is that it can be, well, the nice thing about tree rings is they can be absolutely dated. They can be well-placed in time and there's lots of them. So this is a map of the available tree ring sites that we have throughout uh, the Western United States. And it's these records that have been used widely to give much more detailed information about the drought conditions over the last millennium or longer. And it's the record that we've used to do the studies that um, I'm gonna talk about in a bit. But as I mentioned, I wanted to give you a little bit more context for how we started thinking about this. This is Ed Cook. I mentioned him earlier as a um, co-author of mine. This is one of my favorite pictures of Ed. His wife likes to buy him uh, self-deprecating t-shirts. This is Ed in Bhutan where he's done a lot of work. Um, Ed was really one of the pioneers of dendrochronology out west and really did one of the first studies that comprehensively looked at the spatial and temporal characteristics of drought from tree rings in the American West. And this is from his 2004 paper. In this uh, figure here, drought area is on the, the vertical axis here. So up is increased area of drought. You can see these areas over much of the West where over 50% of the West was covered in drought. You can see this is a filtered record, but these punctuated periods that represented these drought conditions. I think it's interesting when we look back at this paper. So uh, this is a um, call out of this last period of time, the instrumental record. And you can see that already in 2004, Ed was pointing out and thinking about how the first four years of the drought in the Southwest might compare to these longer intervals. So Ed was thinking about these things and doing a lot of the early work, collecting the tree ring records and compiling them and synthesizing them. And by 2013, the drought had been going on uh, for 13 years. And Ed was interviewed at um, a conference in San Francisco. It's, it's the biggest earth science conference that we all go to. And he was quoted in this article saying that the current drought could be classified as a mega drought 13 years running. He went on to say there's no indication it'll be getting any better in the near term future. And this actually got a lot of us thinking we're all uh, collaborators of Ed. And some of us raised our eyebrows at this idea because 13 years still seemed a little short for a mega drought, but it was a provocative statement that got a lot of us thinking about whether or not this was indeed the case. So I actually had a student, he was a uh, CC undergrad and uh, Hunbeck, who I did a senior thesis with. He wrote his thesis on this question. The, the title of the thesis was Mega Droughts as Past Analogs for the Current Drought in the Western US. What I'm showing here is the histogram that Hun put in his thesis. This is the average 13 year period from the tree ring record going back to 850 CE up through 2012. This is where the 13 years from uh, 2000 to 2012 sit in that histogram. So very negative within that histogram, a very unlikely 13 years, but certainly other events within that histogram that um, were more severe. But it was 
Hun's work on his thesis, he graduated in 2014, that really got us thinking about this. Um, he would eventually come back and do a PhD with me, not specifically on this subject, but it's a great story about uh, the work that he did as a CC senior uh, that really became a significant piece of work down the line. So right at the same time, uh, Park Williams came to Lamont. He started uh, as a uh, associate research professor at Lamont. Um, he's a much better scientist than uh, his his fashion sense would indicate in this picture, but he's he's uh, actually a fantastic scientist who really dives deep into his data and. He was thinking about these things too. So when he came, Hun had written his thesis and we were talking with Park and uh, Park decided to really take this over um, as a project that he would look into. And true to form, Park really dove into it. The drop continued to evolve over the time that he was there. He developed a new tree ring reconstruction uh, with Ed, with a lot of new records and so on. And um, only nine years later, or actually seven years in 2020, we published this paper in Science with Park, and Hun was on the paper, as well as some of these other folks that uh, were thinking about this, where we looked at um, the period from 2000 to 2018. So we looked at this 19-year period and evaluated um, how it stacked up against this new reconstruction that uh, we put together going back to the year 800 CE. Um, and then, 2019 was a fairly wet year and we weren't really sure how it was going to unfold, uh, but then we got slammed with 2020 and um, 2021, which were very dry years. And so we decided to follow up on this work, we being Park, Ben Cook at uh, NASA GIS and myself, on um, you know, the 21 year period instead of the 19 year period that we evaluated earlier and did some new things in this study. And, and that's the paper that we published earlier this year. Some of you have, may have seen the news stories on it. It has, because the drought continues, I think received a lot of attention. And this is the paper that I'm gonna really dive into in terms of um, the results that we derived in this paper. So as I mentioned, uh, what we did is, is compiled a large tree ring network uh, to estimate drought conditions on a gridded map over this region shown in the box here, which we called uh, Southwestern North America. And this is just a figure to show you how well trees reproduce soil moisture estimates in this part of the world. So in black here is observed soil moisture estimates going from 1901 up through the present uh, in 2021. The red line sitting on top of that is the mean tree ring reconstruction over this box. And what you can see is the, um, the data overlap very well. If this was a stock prediction, I think you would trust that, trust your money with it. The uh, tree rings explain 88% of the variability in the observations and reproduce very well the observed estimates of drought in this region. And so this indicates to us, as in many locations around the world, that tree rings in this case under these conditions are very good recorders of soil moisture. So because we're fairly confident in the tree ring's ability to reproduce soil moisture, we've used that reconstruction to go back to 800 CE. And this is where the Charlemagne connection uh, occurs. Charlemagne became the emperor, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 800. Lots of things have happened in between, but what I want um, you to know is here's our tree ring reconstruction in red. Here's that black observational period. And what this is showing is a running 22 year average of soil moisture over the Southwest up through present day. So the last 22 year period is right at the end of this time series. So that's the average of the 2000 to 2021 period. And what this is showing is that if you go back in time, there is no other 22 year period that was as dry in the Southwest as the last uh, 20, Two years. And you can see these other mega drought periods. The last mega drought period was during the Elizabethan area in the late 1500s. This was a mega drought that lasted 23 years, so exactly as long as the current uh, mega drought has lasted. Some other droughts that lasted for longer periods of time, but none of them generated a 22 year period as extreme as the last 22 years. <clears throat> 
So how does it stack up in more detail? This is a, a figure showing the cumulative soil moisture anomaly in red for the last 22 years. And these other lines, please ignore the, the blue line, I'll come back to those, but these other lines represent five other of the worst 22 year periods, regardless of when they occurred in the record, but including during the, the past mega droughts. And you can see that as that cumulative anomaly uh, increases, that once we get down here to um, the 22 years, it's drier than any of these other 22 year periods in the record. If we look at the beginning of any of the mega droughts, it's a similar story. So this is, instead of just taking any 22 year period, this is the beginning of any mega drought um, and going out 22 years. And you can see that we've evolved to the driest anomaly of any of those periods um, over the, the record back to 800 CE. And I should say also, that we reconstructed back to 800 CE, but this might be true for a much longer time period. We just don't have the data prior to that um, to say how this stacks up to prior periods. So how do we think about this in the context of um, climate change and, and where things are going? So we know that this is an extreme drought. It's, it's extreme uh, by historical standards going back uh, more than a millennium. Um, how should we think about that in the context of what's happening with climate change and, and where things are going. So one of the things about soil moisture that's important to keep in mind is it's, as I mentioned, it's a soil, uh, it's a moisture balance metric. So it's, it's balancing what's coming in from precipitation and what's going back into the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration through plants. And so it's important to think about the two factors that really drive those two sides of the, le the ledger. The inputs are of course precipitation and one of the most important things for the evaporative part, the, the withdrawal of moisture from the soil is temperatures because temperatures just define how spongy the atmosphere is, how effectively it can take up moisture. And um, so as the, as the atmosphere gets warmer, it takes up more and more moisture and draws more and more moisture out of the soil. And when you look at the precipitation and the temperature out west, so this is the Southwestern precipitation anomalies, the variability in southwestern precipitation is very high. It goes up, it goes down, and uh, there's no real signal in the precipitation, specifically in the southwest, that we tie to climate change through our study. So what I'm showing here in green is an estimate of human-caused influences on precipitation that we estimate from climate models. And you can see that line is basically flat. So what this is saying is that the precipitation variability in the Southwest is largely natural. There's not a, a strong human component in this region in precipitation uh, that we can attribute. And so in terms of the precipitation story, we've had a bad run of luck. We've had some really low precipitation years um, that collectively have contributed significantly to the dryness in the Southwest. But when we look at temperature, that's where we really see the human uh, component. So the Southwest has warmed about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit or about 1.4 degrees Celsius over the last century. And you can see again, this green line representing the human contribution estimated from models creates a significant trend in the temperatures that have been observed. So the inputs from precipitation have largely been natural, but on top of this run of bad luck and precipitation, there's been an increasing amount of temperature anomalies or the temperature has increased significantly such that the atmosphere is drawing more and more moisture out of the soil and taking more and more from that side of the ledger. So when you factor in that human component and you estimate soil moisture in the Southwest with and without that model estimated human component, we estimate that the human contribution to the severity of the drought out west is about 42%. So almost uh, half, almost 42% more severe than in the absence of human influence. So this green line is showing it without showing the, the drought anomaly without the human contribution. And it would have been a bad drought, but it's been made much worse and it certainly wouldn't have competed with the mega droughts as I've shown you, if um, this human component weren't included. In fact, if we look at this animation, you can see the black line showing what actually happened and the green line representing um, the last 22 year average 
if we remove that human component. So again, a, it would have been a significant drought over the last 22 years, but it is significantly more severe because of the temperature element in the Southwest that has a very strong human component that may, has made things 42% more severe. But it's not just the severity that the human component has influenced. So what I'm showing here is the ranking of each grid cell that we've estimated in this tree ring reconstruction over the last um, 1200 years with the human component and with the human component removed. And what you'll see from these two figures is that much, many more locations within the Southwest are ranking as much more severe droughts with the human component, whereas the real severe drought would have been focused in the four corner regions. And there are some regions that wouldn't have even been in drought conditions without this human uh, component. So it's made it more widespread and that's consistent with what we would think of with regard to the temperature element. Precipitation tends to be more regionally focused, but temperature is widespread in terms of its changes. And so this idea that the drought is more widespread as a consequence of climate change is very consistent with that influence. So I wanna come back to these figures and I told you not to look at these uh, dark blue lines, but now I want you to look at them. This is showing what the drought, the cumulative drought anomaly would have been without the human influence. And you can see that it would have been much less severe and would not be beating out some of these mega drought intervals. And the interesting thing here is that the drought probably wouldn't have started into, until 2007, which was a relatively wet year. And so it wouldn't even be 22 years long. It would be a much shorter event currently by the way that we measure the starts and stops of all of this. So in addition to making it more severe and widespread, it also made the drought more longer. And by it, I mean the human influence. So where is this going? So we did some experiments uh, to estimate how long we might expect this drought to continue. And the way that we did that is just took random samples of 40 years from this 1200 year reconstruction that we have, added them to the end of the record as an, as an estimate of what could happen and looked at the probability of these persisting. So this uh, red cloud here is from 22 years out what um, percentage of simulations are in drought. And the axis here is the probability of being in drought. And we estimated last year or in our paper that the drought persisting through this year becoming 23 years was a 94% probability. Uh, we are now two thirds of the way through the summer and it's very clear that this is gonna be another drought year. And so that prediction has come true. But we've estimated that there's even a 75% chance of the drought persisting for 30 years, assuming very conservative human influences into the future based on the experiments that we run, ran. The truth is that nobody knows how long this is going to persist. Um, it's not gonna be over in a year, even if we have one good year of precipitation, it's not gonna be over that quickly. Uh, but this drought very well could end in the next couple of years or it could persist um, for 30 years or longer, depending on how things unfold. And again, the reason for that is because of the temperatures in the Southwest that are increasing and what is really going on, which is an aridification of the region in the Southwest. So things are, the baseline is getting drier and drier in the Southwest. And this is actually an interesting paper that we wrote in 2016, where we were actually estimating uh, the likelihood of a mega drought occurring. In this case, we were estimating uh, a mega drought of 35 years but we were looking at the likelihood based on model simulations of whether or not a 35 year drought would happen during this century. Little did we know that we were writing the paper in the midst of one. But what this is showing is two clouds of points. The blue one are for an aggressive mitigation scenario in the models where we assume significant emissions reductions. And then the worst case scenario, which is basically a burn baby burn scenario um, out to 2100. And the axes here are precipitation change and temperature change. So the precipitation change that the models simulate is anywhere between reductions of 10% to increases of 10% uh, of precipitation in the Southwest. And the real um, worst case scenarios estimate temperature changes in this region of four to five degrees. But what really separates these two clouds of points is the temperature change. 
And what these points are sitting on is this black field that estimates the likelihood of a mega drought. So where there's a lot of black and the points are sitting over it, there's more than a 90% likelihood of this 35 year mega drought occurring. And this is simply showing that it's really temperature in the models that's driving the likelihood of these events. And regardless of what happens to precipitation, temperature is really the driving force. And the reason temperature is a driving force is because what we're talking about in these worst case scenarios into the future is not really punctuated drought events, but aridification of the Southwest. So this is a paper that we wrote in 2015 where we were looking at those model projections into the future. That's this, these colored lines here. These are the tree ring estimates back in time. Here's those mega droughts. And what the worst case scenario is showing into the future for these warming scenarios of four to five degrees is that the baseline moisture availability in the Southwest, so the average sort of moisture conditions that the models are predicting is worse than the, um, the mega drought conditions that happened for just a few decades. So I'm going to summarize really quickly and then just go through a couple of talking points because I think my time is very close. I want to get to the Q&A and the discussion with Lily, but this research shows convincingly that the last 22 years have been the driest since at least 800 CE, roughly 1200 years ago. 2022 is continuing the trend and we expect it to continue Humans have contributed to this event. It wasn't exclusively a human-driven event, like most things in the climate system right now, but we made it more severe and more likely because of our impacts on the climate. And the real serious issue here is not these punctuated events that will come and go, but the increasing aridification and the reduction of water resources in an area of the American West and Southwest that's already significantly limited by moisture. So I'm actually, Lily, thinking that I want to wrap up. I, I, I just wanted some few thoughts for discussion, but I'm actually going to skip over a couple of these. Maybe I can show them if there are questions. But I want to finish on a high note, which is these are challenging and um, anxiety-inducing um, things to digest. The situation is not great. Um, but what I want to remind all of us is that we have a significant amount of agency to change how things are unfolding in places like the Southwest based on our activities. I should go back to this slide and say, there's a lot of really compelling adaptation stories that we can talk about in the Q&A. Cities are really um, in the Southwest are really tackling a lot of these water resources issues. They're doing amazing things to reduce water consumption. San Diego stands out as a place that's reduced its per capita water use by 43% since 1990 through water recycling. They have a water um, desalination plant. They have um, programs to pay people uh, to zero scape their lawns and not um, grow water intensive grasses. Um, they've worked on uh, different agricultural projects to reduce the amount of water loss through um, the water infrastructure um, that's used for agriculture in the, in the region. So lots of important things going on in cities. The problem there is that cities really only account for, or, or individual uh, water consumption only accounts for about 20% of the water consumed out West. About 80% of it is associated with agriculture. So that's the real big um, issue to address in the West. But we can do more than just adapt to water limitations in the West. There's of course the bigger issue, which is reducing our emissions. And I want to just point out that there's a, there are encouraging signs in that area. So many of you have probably heard about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, emissions in the United States have been declining uh, since 2005. Uh, and the projections based on current policy are that we will continue to reduce emissions through 2030 by 24 to 35%. The scientific target is that we have to reduce emissions by 50% to stay on the IPCC projection targets of staying below two or 1.5 degrees C of global warming. So we're not quite there. The Inflation Reduction Act is a much better step in that direct direction. This is a recent Rhodium Group estimate of where we're going with the um, implementation of the IRA. We will expect an increase up to 30 to 40% reduction in our emissions. And that's an important chunk um, for getting there. 
these are climate model estimates of warming up through 2100. And the, the estimates that have been given by the scientific community is that we have to stay below two degrees C um, to really avoid the worst consequences of climate change. The scenarios in the IPCC report have, um, you know, worst case scenarios are upwards of three to five degrees C. But by this estimate, the current international pledges and policies that are on uh, the table put us much below that worst case scenario target and bring us down to something on the order of three and a half degrees and as low as staying below that one and a half or two degrees target. So things are moving, things are changing. It has to do with actions that we're taking. And it's a reminder that we have agency in the face of this challenge. As we tackle the climate crisis, we're all gonna be continuing to do that throughout our lifetimes in terms of how we have to adapt to this, how we mitigate our activities and actions so that we really reduce our emissions and stay below uh, these extreme conditions. But this is a reminder that our actions matter and are actually bending the curve in the way that um, the future is unfolding. And with that, I'll just give you a slide that I put in front of a lot of my students, which is a reminder that we have agency. And I reflect on this quote a lot. This is of course from the Lord of the Rings. Frodo says to Gal Gandalf, I wish none of this had happened. Gandalf replies, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. We all are faced with that choice. We are faced with this crisis, in addition to a lot of other sustainability crises in the 21st century. And I think the question that we all need to be asking ourselves is not if we're screwed, not if I have hope, but what are we gonna do with the time to really help address these issues and think about how we can make the world more sustainable as we move forward. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen, Lily. Is that, or should I leave my um, slides up? I don't know if you wanna go back to some of them. I'll never say no to a Lord of the Rings slide. You can, <laughs> it's up to you, my friend. <laughs> well, I guess there, there aren't many of us who can actually be seen. So I will leave it up just in case I need to go back to any slides uh, and we can look at Frodo and Gandalf uh, while we discuss. <laughs> well, I think it's a really interesting place to end the conversation because you know, we're all experiencing climate change in different ways, but we are all experiencing it. And I feel like um, out here in the West for a number of years now, it's been very in all of our faces and there are very real consequences to people's lives. Um, and sometimes I wonder, you know, how much is that, you know, that visceral feeling towards everything that's going on, making it to other parts of the country. Uh, we talk out here a lot about climate anxiety. I hear stories about that now, and um, and I think it feels very relevant right now. So nice to end on a hopeful note. Um, I'm going to actually, I want to have a conversation with you, but as we go, I'm going to weave in some of the really great questions that you all have been putting into the Q&A. Please keep them coming. Um, but I wanted to first begin on the issue of er eridification because I feel like there's a certain, there's a permanence to that that just has not really been a part of this conversation when we have talked about droughts in the past. Uh, there has been a little bit more of an ephemeral feeling to some of that, um, but this feels very, you know, sort of, um, sort of here to stay, you know, it's something that we could be living with for decades and perhaps longer, uh, perhaps a whole lot longer. So I wonder, you know, how reversible is aridification if mankind were to earnestly try to address it? So I think you're getting at something that's really important, which is, you know, the time scale of consideration here. So we think about droughts in specific regions from year to year. I talked a lot about mega droughts, which are decadal events. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind with regard to those events is they're, they're punctuated and they have a beginning and an end. And the worst thing that we could do when we think about, um, you know, our response to this drought is at some point, this mega drought is going to end. Uh, and it would be foolhardy of us to say, let's get the, start the party started again um, and go back to assuming that this isn't going to be a long-term consequence. And so that really gets to the aridification question that you're asking in the sense that we're going to bounce around and there's going to be some wet periods that we're going to experience uh, in the Southwest again. But that baseline is ever shifting uh, to drier and drier conditions because of the temperature influence on the moisture balance out West. 
And so we have to keep that in mind in terms of our planning and how we think about this. With regard to reversing it, it's absolutely true that um, if we reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, if we um, get to a point where we're no longer emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the aridification will stop. It'll stop at whatever level um, of equilibrium we reach given the increased temperatures and uh, the variable moisture out west. If we start removing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere through negative carbon emission strategies, we could even reverse it in the sense that if we reduce the planetary temperatures through those kinds of actions, um, we could go back. So this is not, there are thresholds in the climate system that we have to worry about where once we cross them, it's impossible to go back at least in, in human lifetimes. So the ice sheets are a good example of that. Once you melt them, they're gone. But this is really not one of those cases. If we reduce emissions, if we stabilize um, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we will stabilize this challenge. And we did have a question in the Q&A asking if the arid conditions that we're experiencing now are restricted just to the southwestern United States? Are we seeing this in other regions or is this manifesting differently perhaps in other places? I mean, generally speaking, the, the West is aridifying. So in, in the United States, um, certainly extending southward into Mexico, um, these drought conditions are impacting um, the US and those regions. On the East Coast, it's more a story of, um, you know, it's the the have-nots in the West and more of a deluge in many parts of the East where um, you know, precipitation is increasing, we're getting more extreme events. Um, and actually that's kind of an important point to make about how we think about drought and its connection to global warming. So global warming impacts some regions that will get wetter and some regions that will get drier. It's not that everywhere um, all at once is aridifying, but there are some regions that are going to get drier and there are other places that are going to be, get wetter. So as you look around the world, other Mediterranean climates like the Mediterranean, like uh, central Chile, are regions that are um, experiencing an aridification trend. Uh, parts of Africa are also experiencing this. Uh, and so there are definitely hot spots of drought globally, but there are also regions that are increasing in the, in the amount of moisture that they're receiving through precipitation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a couple examples, but I'm wondering um, about the policy message uh, that you bear. And, you know, in places like San Diego, which you brought up in your presentation, it does seem like, again, a story of hope, a story of uh, a community that is hearing the message and also, you know, acting upon it, which is really inspiring. Um, can you dig a little bit deeper into solutions, how policy changes like what we've seen there can make a difference? Because again, I think that sometimes people feel that the will is just not there. Um, are cities in particular a better sort of in entry point for this kind of policy change than maybe something at the federal level might be, last week's legislation notwithstanding? Well, I, I think that it's, you have to be careful about separating different policy decisions. So, you know, with regard to water planning, I think there's a lot of cities that we can look at that have made um, really important strides in reducing the amount of water that they use, finding other sources of water like desalination plants or otherwise. Um, and those are, are really good, um, I think, long-term planning decisions that, uh, many municipalities are making. On the flip side, a lot of these municipalities are encouraging growth and their populations are exploding. The Southwest, one of the things that I didn't have a chance to mention is the Southwest is one of the fastest growing regions of the United States. And um, there's a lot of incentive to encourage that kind of growth. And at some point, I think there is um, a point where those kinds of decisions and those kinds of policy driven um, goals, because growth is certainly, I think, in many places, uh, you know, something that's encouraged and something that uh, a lot of places want. Um, but you can only reduce your water consumption so much. You can only find new sources of water um, in so many locations. And so those are, I think, where incentives and policies tend to intersect in ways that aren't sustainable. 
The other point that I would make along those lines is that a lot of the, the drought over the last 23 years has been addressed, particularly in the agricultural sector with groundwater depletion. And with regard to aridification, the, the climate can be brought back to a wetter state by ramping down the temperature increase. But there's a lot of groundwater extraction that cannot be replenished. So groundwater generally is replenished um, over much longer time periods. And in some cases, water is being taken out of uh, aquifer, aquifers so unsustainably and so quickly that it's damaging the aquifer's ability to recharge. And so that's a case where um, we've buffered a lot of our um, water use out west, particularly during this drought, with groundwater depletion. But there are lots of locations where we're never going to get that water back or get it recharged on a human time scale where it will be helpful. So this is I, where you see the ground in some places, in places like the Central Valley of California, actually sinking. Literally decreasing in elevation um, as, you know, the aquifer is underneath the land surface compact and um, those locations are, are lower in elevation as a consequence. And again, I think that's one of these competing incentives. A lot of that groundwater is going to agriculture. And of course, um, there's a lot of reason to help farmers and continue agricultural production in the Southwest. We all depend on that agricultural production. Um, and as these locations are impacted by drought, we pay for it in our pocketbooks and in terms of scarcities. Um, and so there's a lot of incentive for all of us to, to benefit from the Southwestern agriculture and use things like the groundwater that's, that's cultivating it, but it's not being done in a, in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you drive through the Central Valley, uh, you'll see the, uh, the farmers there like to put their feelings on billboards and they're pretty colorful. <laughs> yes. And, I won't you know, any of them here. <laughs> They're good for sayings. No, no, I, I, I agree. But, it, you know, that's also, again, I think in terms of the complexities here, there's these policy decisions, but then there are a lot of stakeholders and interest, interest groups. So you, you have the agricultural sector, you have the interest of um, the indigenous tribes out West, and we've seen, um, and then you have the interest of, um, you know, municipalities and otherwise, and we've seen where those um, interests are really in conflict. So, um, a lot of the conflicts around uh, the Klamath Lake and, and Klamath River in Oregon have played out um, quite extensively over the last couple of years where farmers want more uh, water released from Klamath Lake. A lot of the indigenous tribes around the lake need the water to sustain some of the fish populations that are very important for their uh, culture and livelihoods. And so there's this real, I think, complicated um, conflicting set of interests that are really hard to resolve when we think about just less and less water. We have a question in the Q&A uh, asking if all of this means that other geographical areas are benefiting from the moisture from this disappearance of surface and soil water in the Southwest. You kind of touched on this a little bit. Would love you know, for you to expound on that a little bit. And maybe we can also use this as an entree into a conversation about virtual water how we send our water abroad in the form of crops. I, that's exactly what I was going to say, <laughs> Lily. You might as well take it away. I mean, you know, <laughs> at, at a very basic uh, level, if you eat an avocado that's grown in California, you are eating water that was extracted from that region to grow that fruit, and then the water is being transferred into whatever uh, watershed you exist in. So th that's one way that we move virtual water around the country. But there's other very extreme examples of where this is happening. Um, internationally, uh, more and more international corporations are getting footholds in the Southwest. One, um, I think, pretty extreme example is that Saudi Arabia has bought up a lot, of, um, a lot of land in various parts of the Southwest, Arizona in particular, and they're using it to, to grow alfalfa, which they then export and sell um, or use to feed cattle in Saudi Arabia. And, and this, this has been happening in various ways. I mean, a lot of the alfalfa that's grown in parts of the Southwest is um, exported to other regions uh, for ranching. So 
you know, a lot of the cultivate, a lot of the agriculture, particularly in Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, is livestock production. And, you know, this, this gets to, I think, difficult questions about what kind of agriculture we want to support in regions like the Southwest, which is water limited. Livestock production is incredibly water intensive because you have to irrigate the land that you graze the livestock on, you have to irrigate the land, you have to use water to grow alfalfa to feed to livestock, and then also water the livestock. There's a lot of dairy production in the Southwest, and that's particularly water intensive. Um, dairy cattle use a lot more water than cattle that are raised for beef. So, you know, I, I think there are also hard questions to ask there about what kind of agriculture we want to actually support in this region. And historically, many of you who are listening, I'm sure know this, beef production moved from the east uh, and southeast to the south to the southwest over the last century. So it hasn't always been thus, but for multiple reasons, a lot of the livestock production is now in the southwest, and it's simply um, a very water intensive practice for the region. And Richard Gorman asks, while we're talking about this, he wants you to go beyond Charlemagne to 2,000 years ago, where he says there was desertification around the Mediterranean because of goats in the last 2,000 years. I do not know about this. If you know about this, <laughs> do you want to touch on it? And how comparable is this moment of er eridification that we're seeing to that, to that time? Well, I would say... Desertification is a complicated subject because for a long time it's been used to explain aridification and desertification and effectively blame it on the cultures who cultivate the land in the region. So a classic example was the discussion around the Sahel drought um, in the Sahelian region of Africa, where some of the early discussion around that desertification um, pinned it on the, the people living there, suggesting that they were overgrazing the land um, and causing desertification, when in fact the real explanation for the, desert, the, the drought during that uh, 1970s, 80s, and 90s period had to do with warming uh, sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. Now that's not to say that land use changes don't impact climate. In fact, we are impacting um, the climate through land use changes in many different ways, and it is a factor in another human influence on climate change. But some of these regional stories we have to be careful about because um, they tend to blame the indigenous cultures in ways that haven't um, been accurate in the past and have been used, for instance, to, I think, falsely blame these cultures as, um, as propagating these impacts. I don't know specifically about the, um, the situation that uh, is being referred to in the Mediterranean, um, but there have been aridification periods, drier periods over the Holocene, which is a longer period of 10,000 years that have been important, um, many of which have been climately driven. Uh, but there are also stories of um, impacts on the land surface, certainly globally now, that have had climate implications, but we have to be careful about how we interpret some of those. I want to ask you to talk a little bit more about Lake Mead. Um, I really enjoyed that part of your presentation. I wonder how much of the story um, of what is playing out there now, since we're seeing the story everywhere, um, is about drought, and how much of it is about something else. It, we talked about this earlier about just humans managing uh, the resource badly or perhaps not adapting to the way or the place we are now. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and you know, I, I do think it's interesting because Lake Mead has sort of become this poster child uh, for the drought. And it's much more complicated. So the, the dirty secret is that Lake Mead has been getting the same water allocation from Lake Powell um, every year over the course of this drought. So they are, through the Colorado River Compact, they're obligated, they being Lake Powell, is obligated to provide Lake Mead with 8.23 million uh, uh, acre feet of water every year. In years past, when the drought conditions were not as severe, Powell has 
has transferred surplus water down to Lake Mead because the water use on Lake Mead is over allocated. The upper basin, which draws its water from Lake Powell, for many years has not been over allocated. So they've used less water than they're allowed and they passed a lot of those surpluses down to Lake Mead. So part of the story is over allocations from Lake Mead downriver. An important development in the 1990s was uh, the Central Arizona Project, which allowed Arizona to really take its full water allocation, which was another important development in this. But all of those things collectively have gone together to um, draw more water from Lake Mead than they're getting from uh, the upstream sources. So a big part of the story is over allocation of Lake Mead and the way that water is being used, um, particularly in the lower basin in Arizona, Nevada, I'm sorry, in, uh, yeah, Nevada, uh, California, and Arizona. Um, Drought is playing a role in the sense that it's, so no, Lake Powell is no longer giving surplus water. There are also, there's a, a fraction of water that comes in from the tributaries between Powell and Mead that also is part of the story. And there is also increased evaporation off the surface of Lake Mead due to the more arid conditions in the West through the same kind of evaporative process that I've been talking about. But the story is much more nuanced in the sense that it is a drought story, but there's another aspect of what's going on, particularly in the lower basin on the Colorado, that has to do with over allocations and unsustainable water use, essentially using more water than, than uh, is in the river that must be dealt with as we think about policies moving forward. I should say the Colorado River Compact is going to be renegotiated in 2026, and it's hoped that these kinds of consider considerations are factored into the new agreement so that um, the allocations are much more sustainable in terms of the actual amount of uh, water in the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Harriet Fields had a couple questions about the Colorado River. So Harriet, if you have other follow-up questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A chat area. Um, one of the things I was really struck by um, as I was reading up on your work uh, is, you know, the environment that we are all operating in right now is obviously very polarized. And there are a few issues that are as polarizing, it seems, as climate change. Um, I think we as in the media have evolved a lot over the last few years, just in terms of using certain baseline assumptions, or I don't want to call them assumptions, baseline facts to, um, to operate from when we sort of scaffold our stories. Um, and so I wonder, you know, do you find ever that uh, people use your research in ways that, um, you know, really twist the spirit of what the conclusions are? Uh, do you ever end up having to deal with purveyors of climate misinformation who, who say, hey, you know, this, this stuff happens every couple of centuries. Look at this guy's research. Um, and if so, how do you deal with that? Um, I usually press delete on my email, <laughs> but you know, these stories, the drought story is a good example of where this happens. I mean, um, you know, whenever uh, our research receives a lot of media attention, uh, there's a lot of great reporting on it, a lot of great attention. The flip side is um, you tend to get a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of emails uh, telling you that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, you're an idiot. Um, you know, there are lots of knuckleheads out there who kind of follow up with those kinds of comments. Um, this, this particular story is, I think, really ripe for that because mega droughts have existed in the past when humans weren't influencing the climate, at least not in a significant way. Um, and so you really, the, the key here is to think about cause. Um, humans didn't cause the mega droughts in the past, and they haven't exclusively caused the current one, but based on the information that I showed you tonight, they've made it significantly worse. And we have the power of um, projections. We've developed this science um, that we've all paid for, that we've all um, valued um, through our tax dollars, et cetera, to, to develop the science well enough that we have very useful predictions for how the future might unfold. And this is a, a signal that's emerging that we're watching unfold, but also that we know is gonna get much worse based on um, our activities. And 
that cause is well established in terms of how human activities are directly connected to increasing temperatures and how those are impacting, impacting a place like the Southwest and increasing the probability of year-to-year -year droughts, multi-decadal droughts, and ultimately aridifying um, the region. And so I think that cause aspect is really important. I mean, you know, another analogy that I often appeal to is that humans didn't cause all the forest fires in the past, but they cause forest fires now through various activities. And so just because something happened in the past doesn't mean that humans can't be contributing to it. And in the context of these projections, we can see that the cause that has a role in the current event is going to amplify and make things much, much worse going forward. So this idea that something happened in the past is only goes so far and is irrelevant if you don't consider what the underlying cause of the events were. And so I, I think there's a bit of game of gotcha where, you know, people jump on this idea, well, this happened in the past and therefore, um, if it's happening now, it can't be something that is the result of, dip, of human activities. But of course, that's not the case. And there's a lot of well-established science that has done a very good job of attributing our activities to the increasing um, probability and severity of these kinds of events. Mm -hmm. um, Christina, and I'm sorry about the yelpy dog, everybody. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. mine. Christina asks, um, what is the most impactful thing we can do as individuals to help combat climate change. Um, another really interesting question, um, and it calls to mind Michael Mann's um, recent book, uh, The New Climate War, Michael Mann, the climate scientist, um, who, you know, he touches on this a little bit, this idea that we as uh, the American public have been fed this idea that it's up to us to make change uh, individually. Um, to, to bring about the change that we want to see when you have a lot of uh, corporate actors that are doing a whole lot more damage um, than any individual in this country might be, uh, might be doing to the climate, to the environment. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of fodder here. I mean, what do you think individuals could be doing to help turn the tide? So I have lots of thoughts. First of all, uh, Mike has known Mike for a long time. Uh, we overlap in a lot of research because he actually does a lot of um, climate reconstruction or at least early in his career over the last several millennia. Um, I think this is a really interesting question for you know a long time. I get this question all the time and it's a really important, I get it because it's really important. And, and earlier in my career, I would try to focus on the individual things that we could do. I, you know, in my environmental conscious, consciousness going back to high school and college have worked for a long time to reduce my environmental impact. Um, and there's lots of things that we can do. We can work, work to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. We can think about that through our diets, how we get around. Um, in New York City, you can source your energy from renewable sources uh, through a contract uh, with the power company. Um, you know, you can think about when you run your appliances. In fact, my partner always gets angry at me because I always leave the dishwasher to go until it's absolutely full, these kinds of things. But um, I, I think about the pandemic when I think about the impact of individual action along those lines in the sense that we showed our capacity to um, vastly change our activities. For a long period of time, we were staying in our homes or apartments. We weren't seeing our friends. We weren't traveling. And the impact on emissions in 2020 was about 7%. And so a massive, a massive, massive um, change in our activities translated to a significant reduction. I mean, it was the largest reduction in emissions um, since before, well, ever, prior to World War II. And it's on par with what we, will, what we would need to do year over year to reach that 50% reduction by 2030. But there was still a tremendous uh, amount of emissions going into the atmosphere, and that's because we're all operating within a carbon-based economy. So we were still you know, using electricity from fossil fuel plants to turn our computers on and have Zoom meetings. We were still heating or cooling our homes uh, with those systems. We were still getting around in cars or whatever it was. And there's a limited number of choices within that system that we can actually influence individually through our actions. 
What is a much more important individual action to take is to engage collective action to really address those systemic challenges. So get involved in politics and the electoral process, engage the decision makers in your community, reach out to uh, your schools where your children are, where you're attending, reach out to your faith-based organizations, really work within those organizations to invoke collective action to address the systemic challenges that we face. I think that's the most important thing that we can do. We are working as individuals, but engaging the sort of scale of activity that we need to address this challenge. The last thing that I wanna make sure I say, Lily, is with regard to um, how this has been manipulated by fossil fuel interests. So it's absolutely true that fossil fuel interests have latched on to this idea that individuals should be purists in order for them to have any say in this issue. So you'll see this in public debate. Somebody will say, we should do something about climate change. And then somebody will say, yeah, but you ate a cheeseburger. That's simply not productive given the systemic scope of things, but it is very effective at deflecting blame. And there's a lot of reporting on this, that this was an in intentional move by the fossil fuel companies to manipulate things like your individual carbon footprint to try to deflect blame from the handful of emitters that account for something like 50% of the total emissions uh, through the use of their products. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind as we think about our individual activities. We certainly can do better to reduce our own environmental impacts and live more sustainable lifestyles, but the most important individual action we can do is to engage collective action. Another question about things we can do comes from Christina, who asks, um, what policy changes or cooperation between agencies are needed that can also attack the problem from a development population level? Um, and then she mentions Nevada, which has paid citizens to get rid of their green grass at home and planting drought resistance, uh, drought resistant plants. Can other efforts like low flow toilets or rain barrels or gray water recirculation in new homes help, especially in places near Utah's Great Salt Lake? That image that you pulled up from my old Bloomberg colleague, Chris Flavelle's story on the Great Salt Lake is so stark. Um, the fact that it has shrunk as much as it has. And yet, you know, the other thing that's very striking, one of the many things about that story is there's still development going on and you still have, you know, uh, on a per capita basis, very low rates for water being charged in that area. So just wonder what you think about, you know, um, what, are, what are your feelings about some of these other policy uh, pivots or, you know, individual uh, actions people can take? I mean, I think, you know, the idea of low flow toilets and, and faucets, you know, on some level it does, this is an example of where it really does come down to individual actions. I mean, the, some of the policies, you know, San Diego is a place that's done this, other cities um, in the Southwest, where they've paid to help people, um, given tax breaks or otherwise, to have people um, put in low flow toilets, faucets, et cetera. It's actually, you know, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, some of that is providing tax incentives for things like heat pumps and uh, electric vehicles. All these things that are based on individual actions, but deployed at scale with incentives can have a really big impact. Salt Lake City is a great example of um, where some of those actions haven't been taken. So they they haven't implemented the, the law, essentially the lawn buyback. And there's a great story in that article about a homeowner in, um, in Salt Lake City who let his, who wasn't watering his lawn and then faced litigation from the homeowners association because they wanted to have green grass. So there's a, without a large scale policy plan, that's an example of where some of these individual incentives play out and can prevent um, activity. Another really important thing in the story with Salt Lake City is that they haven't increased rates. As you mentioned, they have some of the cheapest water in the West and that translates to some of the highest per capita water use in the West. And that is coming directly from the rivers that feed into the Great Salt Lake and diminishing uh, the Great Salt Lake through you know, the, the water use within uh, Salt Lake City. So I think those are all really important policies that um, decision makers at all levels with an eye to this as a long-term challenge need to be thinking about and implementing to, to improve the situation.
So uh, we have a couple questions uh, about <laughs> a question that's sure to make uh, our neighbors here in California very upset. Uh, anybody who lives, say, in Montana or <laughs> Other southwestern states, because here in California, we kind of think of ourselves as being the center of the universe. Um, <laughs> I'm very hip to that. But one of the questions is, are there viable alternatives to the Colorado River as a water source for the southwest, like the far-fledged far -fledged idea of redirecting part of the Mississippi? Um, another person asked, Jorge asked, uh, what about getting, is it fe physically feasible to get water from Montana? <laughs> I actually oh. I cover electricity, and so this this issue of you know cross state wrangling over power is always very contentious. But I'd love your thoughts on the water sharing idea. So I grew up in Eastern Washington. I'm very familiar with these kinds of um, fraught relationships with with uh, fellow with neighboring states. Um, you know, it's it's technologically feasible. I mean, there was actually. Uh, as much as people have been talking about the Great Lakes and the Mississippi, there was actually a plan drafted uh, to divert water from um, the Columbia River to uh, California. Um, this goes back decades, but I mean, that's been a plan on the books and something that has been considered uh, for a way to get more water to California. I, I think those are politically fraught challenges. I mean, if you look at the way that the, the, the Colorado has been managed, just agreement between seven states is incredibly politically difficult. And we're going to see how this negotiation, I mean, the negotiations for the, um, the pact in 2026 are already playing out. And there's already incredibly complicated dynamics um, with that. I can't imagine a politically, a political solution that would bring now more stakeholder states into the equation in terms of how water is used in the Southwest, that's tractable. I just, I don't see that how that actually plays out where you add more actors uh, to the equation and many actors who uh, probably have no real sense of responsibility to the Southwest, especially in light of, you know, it would be one thing if the Southwest was really tightening its belt to the point where there weren't these, you know, unsustainable water withdrawal scenarios playing out. But I think for a lot of locations, as much as the Southwest is an important source of agricultural resources, et cetera, it, it's hard to imagine politically how that kind of um, water allocation would be politically viable anywhere. So let, I guess, let me just say that, again, I come back to this idea that there's much more to gain from more efficient water use. And I think that, and, and changes in the way that agriculture is, is pursued, et cetera, than finding newer, new water sources for an ever expanding um, appetite for water in the Southwest. Ah, that's a really interesting insight. Um, and very, very hard for my California brain to process. Um, I know you have some closing remarks you want to make, but if you have time, Lionel Rivera asked twice, so I'm going to ask this one before we end the Q&A. He says, how does snowpack or lack thereof intersect with the story of Western aridification? So that's a great question. It's really complicated because um, there's lots of ways that um, climate change is impacting snowpack. Obviously, um, we're getting more precipitation as rain, less as snow cover. So when that water is delivered to the basin is changing, which actually is complicated for water management. So it might mean in some cases that um, water is released at inefficient or inopportune times from reservoirs as opposed, I mean, the most important, most important water reservoir in the West is snowpack. And a lot of the water management has been built around the idea that, you know, you get a lot of it over the winter and then it's released over a period of time um, through the spring and into the summer. And that timing is changing. Another thing that is, is happening is the, as things get warmer, even if you're getting a, a increased snowpack, uh, 
the way that that uh, moisture, when it melts earlier, um, either goes into the land surface changes, or you actually do something that's called sublimate. You you go from the solid snow cover directly into evaporation, and as temperatures increase, you do more of that. So you're actually evaporating more moisture from the snowpack itself that never actually even makes it into um, the surface water that that is run off into the reservoirs and, and rivers. So snowpack is um, very important for how water is managed out west and the timing of it is changing drastically as we're getting less snow cover as a result of climate change and the snow cover that we have is melting earlier in the season because things are warming up faster. Well, we are at time. I want to thank you, uh, Jason, and to everybody who asked a question um, and who engaged in this really interesting dialogue. Um, Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you again. This was a pleasure for me uh, and would love your closing remarks. Well, I want to, again, extend my thanks to everybody who helped make this happen, to everybody who came. I really appreciate your attention this evening. and. I simply want to reiterate, you know, this idea of agency. We have the opportunity to make changes and change the future um, as we see fit. These kinds of events are critical for educating yourselves. And what I hope they do is motivate you to learn more, to get more engaged and really understand that you do have a hand in that agency in all of your actions. And so what I encourage my students to do and what I hope I can encourage all of you alumni to do is think about the tools that you have and think about how you can apply them to addressing this critical challenge, not just in terms of water resources in the West, but the climate crisis as a whole, because we need all hands on deck and you all have amazing talents. You are all plugged in and engaged in lots of different ways. And I encourage you to make climate change part of how you think about uh, what you're doing. Thank you so much, Jason. Again, thanks to the audience and thanks to the organizers of this event. I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening.